Chapter 27 of Bram Stoker's Dracula. We find this is the final chapter in his novel, and um, therefore there's quite a lot for us to look at and consider. So what happens at this stage? Well, Van Helsing and Mina approach Castle Dracula. The three vampire women come out at night, but um, Van Helsing's created a circle around them and they cannot cross that. He manages to destroy Dracula and the three female vampires. And they all converge on Dracula and Dracula is obviously destroyed, but Quincy dies and it. I will allow you to decide whether or not you think it is slightly anticlimactic. So we see journals the 1st of November and this chapter begins as a continuation. We left off with her journal um, at the end of chapter 26 where she is talking about how much she loves her husband and she's very, very concerned about him as he as they approach Dra Castle Dracula, obviously in fear for her own life and of course his. Um, Mina and Van Helsing are traveling very, very quickly through the countryside where Jonathan's journal began. And they've, they've been traveling all day uh, by carriage. Now, this is quite interesting because there's a lot of um, parallels between this chapter and the opening chapters. We seem to again have come full circle because, of course, Mina comments on how beautiful the countryside is, but she also says how the peasants are very, very superstitious. She crossed herself and put out two fingers towards me to keep off the evil eye. So Mina's wistful descriptions of the surroundings and the people remind us of Jonathan's journal entries. And again, we have this parallel within the novel. Um, and again, that is a feature that you can explore. So in this novel, there are quite a few parallels, not only in narrative, but also in character, um, in terms of um, in, not not necessarily parallels, but being one's doppelganger. So, of course, you've got Lucy and Mina, or perhaps one's the good, one's the evil. You've got Van Helsing and Dracula. You've got Jonathan and Dracula. So just bear that in mind in terms of exploring how the novel has been created. In one of the houses where they stop, this of course is Mina and Van Helsing, a woman notices the dark red mark on Mina's face, she crosses herself, she wants to keep away the evil eye, so she recognises Dracula's mark. Now remember we are in Transylvania, the land where Dracula uh, reigns, so of course the people will notice and be able to identify such marks. Um, that evening Van Helsing once more tries to hypnotize Mina is somewhat successful and of course they discover that Dracula is still on board a ship. Um, as we go they continue where they're traveling on the 2nd of November they travel towards the Borgo Pass remember where Jonathan uh, met up with the other coach that took him to Drac Castle Dracula of course we are never sure whether or not there was a separate coach driver or if it was Dracula himself. Mina is obviously still feeling very unclean and because of the mark on her face and people's reactions and she's still worried about her husband. On the 4th of November Van Helsing sends a memorandum or writes a memorandum. So they've arrived at the Borgo Pass and Van Helsing again hypnotizes Mina to discover that Dracula is still on a ship and of course Mina wakes up full of energy and zeal she suddenly miraculously knows the way to Dracula's castle she also and I'm going to put nose in inverted commas the location of an unused unmarked road and imagine how much faith it must take for Van Helsing to trust Mina because he does they do choose to take their path. Now, this is really interesting because, again, the question is how much influence is Dracula having and is he luring them into a trap? Mina's very sleeping very heavily and she therefore can no longer make notes. And this is why we have uh, Van Helsing making notes and writing the history. As she goes, Mina explains that she knows exactly where to go because 
uh, the fact that she read her husband's journal. She's still sleeping a lot. She seems even weaker and more than lethargic than before. Again, we still see uh, Van Helsing attempting to hypnotize her, but he cannot do so. He seems to have lost that power. And in fact, Mina is sleeping so deeply during the day, Van Helsing cannot wake her. And it, we, again, are reminded that when Dracula is asleep, she is asleep. So the question is, how strong is their link? So because she is sleeping so much during the day and he is unable to rouse her, she is the one who's keeping watch after sunset. And when she does, um, they spend a night in a wild forest and then housing builds a fire and using a protective holy wafer he creates a circle around them a ring of protection around them so it's at this point where i need to state that van helsing quite controversially succeeds where jonathan Arthur failed as we go into this next part of this chapter, we discover Van Helsing does not fall under the spell of the three vampire women. Um, it, in terms of sexually, more he, he has greater fear, not of um, being overwhelmed and um, enticed, but of losing his sanity. Um, Jonathan failed to kill Dracula at the beginning. But in this case, Van Helsing manages to gain access to the tomb. So it appears that this group, are, the Merry Band, are in fact learning from their past. But as to the comment on why Jonathan fails and why, and why Van Helsing uh, manages to succeed where Jonathan fails, is this perhaps... Um, Stoker's way of of praising and, and giving um, kudos to those who are older and wiser. Um, so back to the circle, he drew a, I drew a big ring so a ring so big for her comfort round where Madame Mina sit, sat. So Van Helsing um, relies on religion symbol. Okay, he uses the wafer. Interestingly, maybe this is why he is so successful, um, because the younger generation rely on modern power. So they are reliant on their guns, which are put to good use when it comes to gypsies and wolves. But it's that ex little bit extra that seems to need they seem to need in order to get past Dracula. So on the 5th of November, the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with bright, hard eyes, the luptuous lips. And we we know this is this is no no news to us. We recognize the three vampire women who arrive. And Mina realizes she's not the only one in danger because they tempt men like they did Jonathan with their bright, hard eyes and their voluptuous lips. So the temptation of Mina is not a sexual one. Please, please don't don't look at this as although it's a highly sexualized novel, um, and the opening, the the bit where Jonathan is tempted by these three vampires of the castle right at the beginning is is every man's dream apparently. I don't think this is a encouragement for um, uh, for women to be sexually involved. It's the idea that. Mina is attracted to them because of the power they seem to exude. And if you bear in mind, she is uh, a Victorian woman, there are restrictions on her. So when these three women say to her, come sister, implying that they, of course, are equals, come to us, come, come. It is the, the idea that she can go and she can have part of this great power that they managed to exude and again it's power over life or death and it and, and it's very strong and it's something that's being offered to Mina in a world where 
this is almost unheard of. So please bear in mind, she's not, she's not enticed by them in terms of their physicality, but not more by what they represent in, in terms of women in control. Um, while all of this is happening, the, the air horses evidently die of fright, again, showing their power. And Van Helsing's only weapon against these, these women is the, the fire and um, the holy wafer. And they manage to hold out till dawn because, of course, as soon as the sunlight arrives, um, the three female vampires disappear. So it's the idea again, the focus is here on on the religious idea of temptation. So if you recall, um, we looked earlier in previous chapters at the temptation of Christ and the idea of hedonism and materialism um, and power. And of course, again, these women appeal to the individual. So when it was Jonathan, they appealed in, in a very sexual form. When it is Van Helsing, his greatest fear is losing his sanity. So, so that is what they play on. In terms of Nina, it's the idea of being able to follow her dreams and become this individual woman with power over her own existence. So that is what they appeal to here. However, it's only in daylight that um, the, the, the enlightened group can, can actually move forward because, of course, the vampires are unable to function during the daylight hours. Um, so we end off with, I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will to my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and God be thanked, she is calm in her sleep. And then we swap over to Jonathan Harker's journal. So we have a brief change, and we get to ex read about Seward and Harker's journey, and we get to understand their slow progress. We then swap to Seward's diary, and he talks about a strange excitement in the air. And despite the fact that Seward seems an unlikely warrior, which we discussed previously in terms of his name and, and perhaps links to Macbeth, he does know what it means to be a hunter. So as he approaches the final battle with Dracula, he comments on the strange excitement in the air. And of course, we we are reminded of that evening when he is filled with, quote, savage delight, end quote, at the prospect of killing Lucy when she was a vampire. So we are reminded that although he is not the stereotypical um, warrior, there is certainly an element of bloodlust. We then swap again to Van Helsing's memorandum and the uh, on the 5th of November. Please note that he only becomes a narrator on these very few occasions and, and only towards the end of the novel because for the rest of the novel, um, his activities, if you recall, have been reported by Seward, who's his younger and doubting protege. And I think that's important because it could be argued that Van Helsing's role is to explain Seaward to a more open-minded outlook towards the supernatural, perhaps. And as I've said earlier, he is the, uh, Van Helsing is the one with the faith. Um, you've got to recall that see that Van Helsing comes into the novel in the second phase when he's brought in to save Lucy. And of course, because he's brought in to save Lucy, he's the acceptable face of the foreigner. So he is still a foreigner but he's an acceptable face because he has come to support the English. So he's set apart, I think, from the other characters. I mean, he's got different language, as we've seen about again with his English. And remember that that's paralleled by, of course, Dracula, who's also learned how to speak English more from books. His religion, he actually outwardly professes his faith, his reputation, his wisdom. And there's a lot of similarities between him and Dracula. Um, he's also he too is able to adapt his personality depending on the people he's with. So he can be charming and frivolous like he is when he was with Lucy. With Mina, he's warm and serious. And in fact, if you recall, Mina describes him as a man of, quote, thought and power, unquote. She describes him as, quote, noble, unquote, quote, resolute, unquote, quote, sensitive, unquote, quote, tender, unquote. And she also describes him as, quote, stern, unquote. So these are 
And these are the many faces we get to see of Van Helsing. His name, I think, is also very interesting, and we haven't really looked at it up till now. Um, but it's often associated with the aristocracy. So as soon as you see the Germanic von, um, it's the implication that he is of um, a higher class. But unlike the Germanic von, the Dutch van means from and locates a family, either to a place of religion or occupation. So despite the fact that housing sounds ominous and diabolical and like it's associated with with hell, it's actually associated with a narrow waterway. So I think we can look at Van Helsing, his name implying that he is a man of great standing. Um, he is a righteous man and he is always on the straight and narrow path. He does not take shortcuts. He does not waver in terms of his uh, ethics. Anyway, so we're we're back 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 to his memorandum on the afternoon of the fifth of November. Um, he and Mina they have arrived on foot at Dracula's castle because remember the, the horses died, and using a blacksmith's hammer he knocks the door castle door off its hinges. And of course they remember Jonathan's description of the castle and the layout, so they're using that and keeping that. They are in their heads, they are able to find the old chapel where Dracula lies during his non-active hours. Again, just a reminder that I think Stoke is the one who introduced the idea that vampires um, or Dracula likes to um, subvert Christian soil and hence why he, he likes to have chapels in which to place his tainted soil. Um, while hunting, obviously, for or following the, this map, Jonathan's map, um, of for the old chapel, of course, Van Helsing manages to find the grave of the three fam female vampires. And it's at this point where he he performs purification ritual. He puts and he puts an end to them. And of course. They dissolve into dust when he stakes them through the heart. And again, we're reminded of the biblical illusion, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. He then finally finds, one, finds this large tomb with the name Dracula on the wall, uh, on the door, and he crushes a holy wafer and he puts it into the tomb. Dracula's tomb, some of the wafer and so banished him from it undead forever because of course you can't come back if there is a wafer I mean a wafer inside the tomb so Van Helsing is the character and again I'm harping back to this unlike the young young guns ha, ha, who use guns he is the character who uses weapons of the superstition he is of the old school, unlike the new scientist Seward and the action man Quincy. He uses the symbols of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, he's both, um, and not, uh, and this is we're talking about Van Helsing. He's both a metaphysician and a scholar. So of course he is so both a scientist and um, a man of of the supernatural. So he deals with mundane science and supernatural mysteries in the same way. He he doesn't give more credence to one than the other. So he's a very open-minded man. And of course, this is a trait that Seawood admires um, and is one that Seawood really struggles to adopt. And, and perhaps again, as I've said, this may be one of the functions of Van Helsing is to, to highlight this to his protege. Van Helsing is clearly a champion of the truth. Again, his name going on the straight and narrow. He's also clearly the leader um, in the, the, the second half of the novel. Um, he's the, the persuasive man. He manages to convince them to um, kill uh, or, or eradicate Lucy or the shell that she, she is. He's the one who organizes them in the pursuit of Dracula. Um, I think he's got to feel a lot of guilt because, of course, his medical skill doesn't enable him to, to manage to keep Lucy or Rainfield alive. But as a kind of a, 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 an equalizer, he seems his, his knowledge and his faith allow him to um, save Mina. So, so maybe 
um, the, they cancel out the other. He's obviously the most religious and has the most religious knowledge out of all the characters. And so, as I've said previously, he could be considered almost as a combination of a scientist and, and a priest because they do go to him for religious um, counselling. Before he leaves the, the the castle, he places holy material around the entrance so the Count can never come back again. Um, we, now, we just now see Mina Harker's journal on the 6th of, of, of November, and the novel ends with a passage from Mina's journal, um, an entry that begins late in the afternoon of November 6th, which is six months the story began okay and so again we're now going backtracking a bit so we, we've seen Van Helsing's memorandum now we're going from Lucy uh, Mina's journal so she takes them back they are on foot traveling through heavy snow there's howling wolves they're closing in and through of course these binoculars Van Helsing spots a group of gypsy men and they're clustered around a cart okay and Housing knows instinctively, obviously, in that card is a box, and in that box is Dracula, and they have to reach that box before the sun sets. So, Van Housing has made sure the Count cannot return to his home and his box of soil in Castle Dracula. Now they've actually got to get um, to, to Dracula himself. So they've gone all of this now to the afternoon and they're heading back out. And they've got to do it before sunset. And of course, sunset is approaching rapidly. And this makes for a very dramatic scene because, of course, you can see the sun in the background and, and it's very tense because they've got to get there in time. And, and the, the gypsies know that they're driving the cart with Dracula and they know they're also against the, the clock and, and the chase is converging and, and we've got people coming from all angles and it is very, very, very stressful. And of course, Mina and Van Helsing watch Quincy and see what approach from the south and from the north is Arthur and Jonathan and simultaneously six people converge on this wagon and the gypsies and while all of this is happening, you can imagine it happening in slow motion. The gypsies, uh, the, the gypsies are, are, are overwhelmed and the sun is still setting and the tension is very, very high. All right, closer and closer they drew. So Stoker has drawn out the denouement over several chapters, but the end is now approaching. And we, of course as a reader are aware that a resolution is imminent and, and, and Mina and Van Helsing give us this clear view because we, like them, are the audience of the action and we get to see this final chase from their perspective. So we see Jonathan and Arthur stop the gypsies using their Winchesters, their guns, just as Quincy and Seward are wielding their guns. And of course the gypsies try and defend themselves, but they're disorganized, unlike our merry band of men. And the scene gets very, very chaotic. And it's Quincy's readiness to leap into battle without question that actually loses him his life. Um, he is killed by one of Dracula's loyal gypsies, but as he dies, he is rewarded because the curse on Mina is lifted. And, and perhaps Quincy's, Morris's role is to assist heroically in the destruction of the enemy, um, but at the same time, perhaps it is his opportunity to save to save Mina. Some have argued that he is a symbol of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, um, and this is reflective of how um, in the late 1800s, when of course this text was written, Britain had begun to realize that America was a rising power and that America would be a very, very powerful ally. And, and that is, I believe, what Quincy, part of what Quincy represents. So Quincy um, is, is this American action man, uh, is, is sacrificed um, and with almost superhuman strength and effort, Jonathan eludes the defenders and the gypsies and he leaps on the cart and he drags the box containing Dracula to the ground and in the background the sun is almost set and 
he and Quincy, Quincy's got his knife and he's slashing through the gypsies and they, they, yeah, he helps Jonathan force open the lid and then this is when he's fatally stabbed but before he dies they rip off the lid and it's this very um, action filled tense final battle these guys confront the monster and it's actually quite anticlimactic because we've had this long build up to finding Dracula and all of a sudden these two leap on the coffin, open the coffin, kill Dracula and Quincy dies. Um, I think it's, and, and I spoke about this in chapter 25, I think it's very important that um, Jonathan is the one who gets to kill Dracula with his, his Bowie knife um, because, of course, Dracula threatened his wife. Now, now remember again, the idea of stabbing in a knife is, is a, has very uh, sexual connotations. It's the idea of penetration and, it's, and, and the violence with which, which this is taken out um, evokes images of rape, which, of course, again, we were, it was suggested that when Dracula attacked Mina it she was unwilling and therefore it was in a way although it wasn't um, rape in the traditional sense it was a form of rape because he took control of her um, intimately without her her say um, so it's fitting that this man whose wife has been threatened is the one who gets to face um, Dracula and, and he he with Quincy, this American action man, they get to the two of them get to to kill um, him. And like Arthur, who manages to stake Lucy through the heart, this killing, a stabbing of of Dracula with his great Bowie knife allows Jonathan to regain his manhood. So why is he would not allowed to do this? Well, he lacks resolution. Quincy has to be heroically sacrificed. It's necessary in the struggle against evil. Somebody has always got to be sacrificed in order for there to be victory. And of course, it's Quincy that is done. Again, interestingly, he is the foreigner. So you could think about the ramifications and how some people may have perceived his death. Um, Obviously, on an allegorical level, the strength of Americans will serve the British nation in warding off a foreign invasion. So, uh, Mina and Jonathan remember and honor Quincy, obviously, in a way that is suited to an ally and, and a worthy equal. And, and again, regardless of the allegorical aspects and the idea that a, there's a special relation, that a special relationship between England and America has been forged. Quincy dies, quote, with a smile and in silence, unquote. And again, this serves as a peaceful resolution to the novel. Okay. okay. But back to the action. Inside the box is the dreaded Dracula. He's covered in unholy dirt, which has been thoroughly jostled about. And as the six of them stare into the coffin, Dracula's eyes look towards the setting sun. And I saw the count, the last sign of the count, is as he wakes mistakenly, he thinks he's won, but it's too late to defend himself because the look of hate in them turned to triumph. And then he realizes he's too late. And the look of peace um, that he has in his eyes suggests perhaps that he needs to die and that he will now be at peace. So Jonathan is finally able to get revenge against Dracula. At the very last moment of sunlight, Jonathan chops off Dracula's head, Quincy stakes him, and we have Jonathan able to get his revenge. He, his captor, his wife's seducer, has been eradicated. He's used his knife, this fast phallic imagery. He's reasserted his masculine superiority over the foreign usurper. Okay. So Mina notices how, of course, uh, in, Dracula, in death, Dracula has a look of Okay, 
And as I said, this is quite interesting because it's, it, the implication, it suggests that he's obviously released from an unhappy existence and, and, and perhaps kind of creates a sense of softening. Um, he's this, he's been perceived as this, Dracula is perceived as this monstrosity. And of course, by Mina pointing out that perhaps he is now at peace, it not only makes her look amazing because she's able to forgive him, but it reminds us, perhaps, that um, Dracula was once a human being. Um, the idea may be that, as in death, humans can find peace, and maybe his expression implies that he's been humanized by death. Um, and if you look at it this way, obviously, I think you can look at, uh, to some degree, Dracula can be seen as a tragic figure. Uh, he demonstrates the downside of ambition and arrogance, and, and perhaps if the novel weren't so melodramatic and the ending wasn't so over the top in terms of, of trying to create tension, maybe this line would have had a greater impact. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting thing to consider. So, of course, the, the killing of Dracula represents the social victory of middle-class morality, I think, over the corrupt morality of the aristocracy. Um, the latent virtue of Dracula is, is revealed in Mina's account only um, because he looks at peace when he's freed from his vampire form. And remember, of course, the vampire form is representative of um, the aristocracy. The, the peace, um, again, is, is, is important because the ultimate, even, the, the fact that Mina is able to forgive him shows that even the ultimate vampire can be forgiven. Um, and maybe this is also part of why Mina is saved. Um, she's saved from destruction. Um, and as a result, others manage to benefit from, from salvation. So I think her reaction to the Count's death is the most significant part of the conclusion because he dies just as the sun sets and, and metaphorically it marks the end of an era or a time um, and at the end of it Dracula has not triumphed and and Mina notices that just before he disintegrates he's got this piece and and she seems pleased that he's managed to find this piece and again we need to be reminded that this just demonstrates her merciful and sympathetic nature because she is able to forgive this man. Um, as soon as the gypsies obviously see the body disintegrate and with, uh, they just withdraw and run away. And of course, as soon as Quincy dies, as already said, Mina is released from the curse of the mark on her forehead. And she says, to our bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died a gallant gentleman. Again, remember, please, Quincy has not died in vain. So interesting here, because this is Mina, if you recall, this is still Mina's diary entry. And her last contribution to this narrative, because this is her last contribution, is not an expression of individual feeling. She's talking on behalf of the group. She is expressing the group's respect for Quincy. Okay. Um, and again, this combined with the fact that she forgives Dracula, that she, she believes he is worthy of pity, reminds us that she is a very very sensitive character. And a modern reader might view her place in society as limited because, of course, she's relegated to wife and homemaker. But I think Stoker is trying to make her seem moral and resolute and very firm in her faith by the way she behaves. Um, I think you can say, again, maybe she is somewhat contrived as character, but she embodies the Christian understanding of suffering, sacrifice and redemption. She believes, and, and, and as we've seen the whole way through, that God is testing her faith um, and that she's not worthy. But she, the fact that she's accepting and, again, able to forgive someone who is 
destroyed. People who are close to her um, just highlights her humility, her courage, and her strength. Um, we then move on to the note, and this is this is the last uh, part of the novel. It's seven years later. It's attached to the end. It's written by Jonathan, um, and it, it it kind of talks about it's it's need they needed seven years gap in order to think back and reflect. Again, remember seven is a very important number in terms of Christian faith and in and and the Hebrew tradition it's a number of um, completeness so again seven years afterwards they have completed their morning cycle they have completed their understanding they can look back on this and that's why this again part of the this uh, note is seven years later um, Mina and Jonathan have a son named Quincy, um, in memory, obviously, of the members of the little band of men. Um, they tell him, they will tell him that about the, the, the story, and they will tell him who he has been named after. Um, they have, the Hawks have returned to Transylvania, and in returning, they cannot believe what um, has actually happened. Arthur and Seward are both happily married. And interestingly and ironically, only the typewritten account of events remains. They are none of the original documents. And it's the idea that how can they expect anyone to believe what's happened? Uh, so little Quincy will one day know how much his mother was loved by all the men he is named after. So that's, that's what... Uh, basically is going on in this note um, but we need to look a little bit deeper so we've got Gollumming and Seawin both being happily married off um, Seawin is now happily married which of course is in direct contrast to him at the beginning when he was Lucy's first unsuccessful suitor so we, we're reminded again at the end we, when we first uh, we, we, we have to cast our mind back and we think of him as, quote, a poor fellow or broken hearted, unquote. We are reminded that he is, quote, a man of noble nature, unquote, with a, quote, strong jaw and good forehead, unquote. He's also, quote, good and thoughtful. Now, these are all, unquote, and these are all right from the beginning. And again, the novel has come full circle. And the final impression of Seawood clearly is very different to our first impression. Because we are told right at the beginning when Lucy rejects him, he, quote, cannot eat, cannot rest, unquote, and that his, quote, whole life had ended, unquote. Lucy turned down his proposal. His heart was broken. And he is now able, and we are now able to look back and say, well, it's because of his broken heart that um, he was unable to notice the link between Renfield and a Dracula, but he did, because he was so heartbroken, that is why he focused on Renfield in the first place. Um, so perhaps it's his failure to protect Lucy and, and, and later Mina that, that mean, makes him step up and, and fulfill his role as a traditional man. So he, he sees what happens when he doesn't do his job. He's this man of science, a modern man, up to date with cutting edge technology, such as phonographs, blood transfusions, um, the whole idea of the mesmer. Um, and, and, and some have argued that perhaps you could look at um, Seward as a bit like a companion slash sidekick who fails to grasp the more salient, salient points. He needs things explained to him. Um, and this, of course, allows the reader us to feel superior because we understand yet he doesn't seem to so i suppose you could look at him a bit like um his relationship to van helsing is a bit like dr watson's is to sherlock holmes perhaps um but despite all of his failings and his uncertainties remember he's a very large part of the narrative he is the bulk of the narrative and he does learn as the story goes on because of course he learns to trust Van Helsing. Um, he becomes Mina's guardian. He promises to protect her. And his broken heart is finally restored. So the man is rewarded. So, of course, 
is Arthur. Arthur is rewarded for what he has done and his strength and his support and his loyalty. Um, we've got obviously, um, we got Van Helsing sits with thought at the end of the third paragraph and housing summed it all up when he said with our boy on his knee we want no proofs we ask none to believe us so interestingly van housing is given the final speech in the novel and in it he displays the exact opposite of a scientific outlook he demonstrates an elitist view of the world here and implies that other people's views are of no importance so he says um, that he is aware that there is no evidence, there is no proof. But do you know what? He doesn't really care if nobody else believes what they have written there. So we have this novel ending with Van Helsing holding little Quincy Jr. on his knee, the image of an avuncular grandfather. He tells little Quincy about his mum's virtues. And of course, Van Helsing represents what happens when, of course, wisdom is pursued. And he also demonstrates the importance of defending the innocent and the vulnerable. So, of course, little Quincy represents innocence and the future. And this, of course, has been secured because of the actions of brave and honorable men. So we are given this image of this kind of grandfatherly man. And we're reminded at how far Van Helsing's come in his beliefs. Um, over the course of the novel, it could be argued that the men have consistently failed to protect the woman. Lucy's dead, Mina was attacked, um, and maybe this is why Quincy has to die. And he needs to be sacrificed so that they can all learn a lesson um, and for the defeating of Dracula to be worthwhile. And as Van Helsing point, points out in chapter 10, quote, we learn from failure, not from success, unquote. And perhaps this is why he uh, draws attention to the daring love of all men and why the lesson is embodied in little Quincy. And if you recall, I think it's suggested in a, in a very obscure way that Van Helsing may have lost his son to a vampire. And if you remember back to Lucy's funeral, he talks about how Arthur reminded him of his son. But um, and and he talks about in chapter 27 how his motive for hate is so strong when he destroys the female vampire. But I think it's important because clearly Van Helsing's confident that little Quincy will come to learn that m these men were inspired to do good because they loved a good woman. And and maybe Stoker suggesting that future generations need to be taught about the past. And they need to acknowledge and appreciate their roots and realize the proper role of woman. And the proper role of woman in his eyes is to be worthy of a, woman, a man's love. And Mina represents the vision of womanhood. This brave and gallant woman has been saved from the evil forced upon her. And the men save her because they love her. Um, and, and, and so that's quite an, an interesting outlook there in that women have to be worthy of men's love. But it's also the idea that when men love, they are um, they are, are very, very devoted. I think also because that Jonathan um, is the one who manages to end the novel and he is the one who speaks um it shows that he's also being rewarded for his defense of social stability. Um, he has a nagging suspicion nobody's going to believe the story. But he said the story. He's told the story. So if we choose not to believe it, that is our decision. Interestingly, he again allows Van Helsing to have the final word. Maybe he, he does this because he's content with the fact that his son will be allowed to grow up. Because they have saved the world. His son will be allowed to grow up. His son will be allowed to find the love of a good woman. And the way this is all being set out, we kind of get, I think we get the impression that this is what Jonathan set out to do. So on a final note, I think in this final note, Quincy is eulogized. He's the hero who gave his life to save Mina. He's obviously presented as a solid honorable, um, loyal, and dependable man. 
Note that, however, that um, he is the one mentioned in the end. Lucy is not. Could this be because she's not viewed as respectable? My question, however, is did she not suffer? Was she not sacrificed? Perhaps, uh, and perhaps this is where we need to look at the fact that maybe Lucy hasn't been mentioned because she is the antithesis of Mina. She is the fallen woman. She cannot be saved from herself. She's constantly contrasted with virtuous Mina and, and is always shown to be lacking. Remember, she's not bad. She just lacks moral fiber. And I, I think the fact that Arthur and Seward, two of her lovers, have moved on and are now happily married kind of shows us that she's really just poor Lucy. Um, we Again, we need to remember that she was very immature and she, she didn't want to disappoint anybody, especially men who showed her attention. And remember, she made disparaging remarks about her gender uh, about, and she called um, men cowards. And remember, she reminded Mina um, that we were reminded, we were reminded that Mina's the new woman in the story. And it's her typewriter that created the narrative, if you recall. But I think by Stoker allowing Jonathan to draw a discreet veil over the loss of poor Lucy at the end of the novel, I think reminds us for all, we are reminded that for all her wildness and her vibrancy, um, which she obviously demonstrated in her letters and her speech, she, she just doesn't have any real strength of character. Um, she seems to be, I don't know, dogged by, by pessimism and negativity and she's selfish and, and and maybe her lack of character makes her seem helpless. I, I think a modern reader finds her very frustrating and vacuous. Um, and the fact that she's transformed into a wanton and voluptuous sexual being is almost inevitable. Um, she, she's being portrayed, or she is portrayed in the text, as almost like a dumb, sexualized bimbo. Um, and again, I draw your attention to the fact that Interestingly, Stoker describes her physically as as beautiful, but when she tra approaches the transformation, she would actually reacts in horror. Remember how he talked about her as pure and then later as unclean, and maybe Stoker is exploring that adage that beauty is only skin deep. Uh, maybe I'm giving Stoker too much uh, too much credit here. Remember though this text explores sexuality and the danger of repressed sexuality. So not only are we looking perhaps at xenophobia, but the idea that Victorians repressed sexuality and the dangers that came came, came along with it. I think it also describes um, or just explores a connection between sex and death um, and the Victorian view of sex and death. And he uses Lucy to do this. Again, Please, it's up to you to, to agree or disagree. Um, and maybe Lucy's beauty and vanity are warnings um, to, to, to the reader that hedonism is, is not necessarily a good idea. Um, many have even argued in the past that, of course, Lucy's voluptuousness is a parody of the Victorian prostitute, which was regarded as a, a sexually voracious figure that combined fear of sex, death, and disease. But again, remember that this text is open to interpretation. And you are welcome to interpret it in the way I've interpreted it, or, um, and I'm hoping you've done a lot of reading around it and are, are prepared to argue against my points, because I'm only giving you a specific, uh, one point of view here. Um, and it's up to you to be able to argue against what I'm saying and provide examples, or if you want to argue and support what I'm saying and you agree with it, make sure you've also got the examples to back up what you have to say. But again, remember in terms of the AOs, it is AO1, AO2, AO3, and AO4 that you get marked on in this, in this particular uh, component.